everybody. Hope you're having a good start of the week here, especially those of you on the East Coast. We're pretty light here, and I'm wondering if it might be because people are uh, getting batting down the hatches of the East Coast, so we wish them all the, the best. So as usual, this is the best time to ask questions, concerns, things going well, things going poorly, and we will certainly address them. I've got a couple of things I want to cover today, but we have one question here. Um, discuss using or exploding, exploiting a dirty U4. I, I, I guess I'm uh, what, uh, what I would understand that to mean is what if you know that their current broker um, has a bad um, U4? Well, let's think about this a second, guys. What do we do at the disclosure meeting? We disclose. So you think, hmm, what if I could disclose that their U4 is bad? What, could, what if I could disclose that they're, they're having problems in the past with their broker dealer or whatever it may be? Well, if you think about it, how easy is that going to be to get the client to tell you that? Or is it going to be you telling the client that? Is it going to be you showing the client that? If you, and if this is a great, um, actually a great question because we're going to address that today. If you have to tell them something, are they going to believe it? Who's the only person they believe, guys? Who's the only person the client's going to believe? Themselves, exactly, Fred, themselves. So, and I've talked about this before. There's been, there was, Emory University did a study, and uh, maybe some of you probably remember Abu Ghraib prison was a prison where they supposedly uh, tortured Iraqi prisoners. So what Emory University did is they said, uh, so first of all, does everybody get the, what the question was, how do you exploit a dirty U4? Somebody, if you've discovered that the current advisor has uh, bad things on their U4. So how do you exploit that? So I want, I want you to explain something. If... Um, so the Emory University gave two different studies. They had Group A and Group B. Group A, they gave them over, overwhelming, overwhelming uh, proof, uh, reports, news stories, video that the that the there was the military was not to blame for that. And Group B was given overwhelming proof, reports, news, video, overwhelming video that the uh, uh, um, military was to blame for that. And then they mix them all together. They mix group A and group B together. And then they just asked group A and group B two questions. One is, what, are they, what was their feelings about Amnesty International? And two, what is their feelings about the military? And based on those two questions, regardless of whether the people were in group A or group B, the, the, um, um, the people who asked the question, those two questions were able to determine um, the, based on the answers to do they like the military or do they like Amnesty International, whether those people within a 97% accuracy rate would say that the military was to blame for Abu Ghraib prison or not. So what's my point about that, that, that study? So group A, group B, one giving overwhelming proof one direction, one giving overwhelming proof the other direction, but simply based on two different uh, uh, questions, did the proof affect people's opinions at all? Overwhelming proof. I'm talking about two, two feet of documents, hours of video. No, you're right, Frederick. It didn't affect their opinion at all. So if I whip out a U4 to tell them, show them that their guy is bad and they like their guy, what are they going to do with that report? You cannot prove anything. The only thing that you're exactly right, Frederick, they're going to ignore it. You cannot prove anything. The only person they believe is themselves. So if you can figure out some sort of way for them to discover for themselves, for them to stumble upon you for themselves or whatever, then yes, it will work. But guys, we've been doing this for 12 years. I've had 12 guys make over a million dollars a year doing this, and guess what? Not one of them needed to do. Pull up a dirty U4. So why do we want to change the system, guys? Do the system the way it's designed, and you'll have the success that <laughs> hundreds of guys have had before you. So don't try to prove that their guy is bad. Let the, guy, let the client discover for themselves. And there's no way for them to, to discover for themselves that the guy has a bad U4, nor do you need it. Okay? So uh, my point today, and if anybody else, uh, first of all, is any questions on that, guys? Questions or comments on that? Uh, my point today is FINRA has their crosshairs on REITs. 
So what are they looking at when it comes to REITs? Well, here's what they're looking at. First of all, guys, are you running in a lot of people buying REITs lately and a lot of guys selling REITs lately? I've, I've heard a gazillion people selling REITs. They're in love with them. Well, they're in love with them so much that the FINRA, anytime, anytime the industry falls in love with the product, guess what FINRA starts to do? Look at it. And guess what they found out when they started looking at it? This is in the Investment News, the October 8th, uh, this year's um, uh, issue. Brokers and deal broker dealers and brokers failed to conduct due diligence on non-traded REITs and private placements. Red flags were ignored on REITs that are in danger of going under. So why do you think BDs and brokers are ignoring the red flags on REITs? That, why do you think they're ignoring the red flags on, uh, on money? Right, Dale, what do you mean by money? How much money, what's the commission on these things? High or low? What's the commission on REITs, guys? If you don't know, it's high. It's one of the highest type of investments you can get uh, commission-wise. That's why they're ignoring it. So here's what they found. They found non-traded REITs borrow funds to make distributions if operating cash, is, uh, cash flow is insufficient. So what does that mean? It means they're borrowing from, from the actual... Because it makes money for them, commission between six and seven. Exactly, Al. Ponzi scheme deal, exactly. So, yeah, that, that's, that's what this means. Exactly right, Dale. This is what it means. Non trader REITs may borrow funds to make distributions if operating cash flow is inefficient. That's a Ponzi scheme. They're borrowing from principal to pay out distributions. But get, what do the people think they're getting? What does the clients think they're getting when they, when they get this distribution? What do the clients think they're getting? Principal and interest or just interest? Yeah, just dividends. So this is, I mean, dividends, exactly. So, and that's not what they're getting. They're principal and interest in many, in many cases. Distributions may actually be pre return of principal, and you should not, and, and here's what Finder is telling the brokers, you should not make comparisons of REIT dividends to other investments. They are not alike. Therefore, if somebody's selling a REIT and promoting the dividends as being fantastic, are they breaking the law? At least are they breaking uh, FINRA's uh, rules, the regulator's rules? Yes, they are. So... Uh, I would have this article at the ready, um, and and uh, or understand what this article is saying, so that as you're comparing what they have with REITs to dividends, that you're able to describe this to the client. Make sure the client understands that it'd be like if if I had a CD that was paying six. You know what? Under these rules that the REITs are working right now, could I have a CD paying six percent? Under the rules that these REITs are working with right now, could I have a, have a, a CD paying 6%? Yeah, Al says, exactly. Yes, I could. Because all I would do is give you what? Half a percent interest and five and a half percent um, return of principal. So uh, be aware that if you're running into head-to-head -head competition with REITs, what you're, <laughs> what you're up against. So FINRA has found many representation, misrepresentations and distributions and share valuations. So why, how can you use this, folks? Well, you're going to use it when you run into REITs as competition. Are you going to tell people that REITs are bad? Are you going to tell people REITs are bad? No, you're exactly right. They're not. You're going to help the client discover for themselves how REITs work. Could you use the CD example? Yeah, just say, you know, I can get you a CD paying 5.5% or 6% interest, too, under these rules. So make sure that you understand what, what you're competing against and make sure you're understanding what your uh, competitors are, uh, are out there promoting. Okay, so any questions on this before we go on? Okay, so we're going to talk about GOTS, the most important skill you can have. If you were ex uh, excellent at GOTS, you will make far more money than if you're excellent at the scripts. I've seen guys that have been excellent at GOTS, getting on their side, and have been poor at the scripts that have made a ton of money. I've seen people who have been excellent at the scripts, but are terrible at GOTS, that barely crack the $150,000 a year mark. It, but when you combine both GOTS and the script is when you can make a million dollars a year. But I've seen people that did not know the scripts, that, but did know GOTS, that made a ton of money. If you're going to Error on one side, guys. What do you think you should err on? Learning the scripts or becoming an expert at GOTS? Learning the scripts or becoming an expert at GOTS? If you're going to err on one side, 
No gods. Exactly right, Eric. Gods. Everybody's saying gods. You're exactly right. Getting on their side. So what is getting on their side? There's actually two parts to it. One uh, is getting on their side, which we've talked about, which is when they say something, we agree with them. We tell them that we think the same way. We understand where they're coming from. We get into their shoes. We actually start to think, view the world the way they view the world. Now, the one time we do it is when they give us objections. And when they give us objections, we're going to really get on their side. We're going to spend five minutes explaining to them why what they said was right. So that's, that's a, a, a big way we use getting on their side. And then we also use getting on their side during uh, conversations. And those of you that have uh, uh, been on the monthly uh, coaching calls with Jeff or myself with the small groups, that's what we've been going through, that tape where we showed you in four minutes the gentleman had 14 opportunities to get on the client's side, but instead he walked by all of those. And this happens regularly. So you, you're getting on their side. Yes, you're going to do it during the big things like objections, but you should be doing it continually through conversations. So that's the one side is getting on their side is part of God's, and there's another part of God's, which is getting them to tell us. So we never explain anything, and that's kind of what I was talking about earlier, y using a dirty U4 uh, you better not, just whipping out something and trying to and showing them and saying, "Hey, look at see here's proof of something." Because guys, proof is worthless. You cannot prove anything to anybody. So Jeff, what would you what would you say to that? That you can't prove anything to anybody. Oh, I would agree with it. I mean, people only only a couple things could happen if you pr try and prove something. Either they won't believe you; they'll think you're trying to make a mountain out of a molehill. Um, because they know you want their business, you have a, a vested interest, but even if they did believe you, um, which is rare, because they only believe themselves, they just go back to the other guy. And ask him, and he's, is he going to have all sorts of explanations? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> and guys, they will believe any... You've seen, again, a good example of this is when, when a, a, a woman is dating a guy that's really bad for her, really bad for her, and finally her friends convince her that he's a bad guy and they saw him out drinking and blah, blah, blah. And then she goes back and confronts the guy. What does the guy do? He explains himself. And what does she do? Forgive him. You can't tell people or prove anything to people. They have to decide for themselves. Okay? So these are the two skills, getting on their side, which is agreeing with them. And then the second part of the gots is getting them to tell you instead of you telling them. Don't tell don't sell, don't preach, don't teach, and unfortunately, guess what all advisors, all salespeople are excellent at? Telling, selling, preaching, and teaching. Can't do it. Got to let them tell you. So that's the skill we're going to work on today is the getting them to tell you, at least to get started on, on, on uh, building your skills that way. So I want you to understand how you use these skills. The important thing of selling is if we're both, if the client knows that I think like them. If they know that we're thinking exactly the same, how good is that? If they know that whatever's going on in their head is going on in my head, what does that accomplish? We buy from people who what? Think exactly the opposite of us or think just like us? Exactly, Al. They're, they think that they're just like us. People buy from people who think just like them. So we want to make sure that whatever going on in their head is going on in our head and vice versa. So when should I do all the talking? When should I do all the talking? Does anybody know that? When should I do all the talking? So if I know what's going on and or if they know what's going on in their head, what I want them to th what I want to think just like that exactly, Eric. So if they give us an objection, do they know what's going on in their head? If they give us an objection, or if they state something, some fact that they view, or something that they view as a fact, do they know what's going on in their head? If they state an objection or a thought, do they know what's going on in their head? Obviously they do. They stated that objection or that fact. But do they know what's going on in my head? No. They know what's going on in their head. They gave an objection. They said a statement. They, they know what's going on in their head, but they don't know what's going on in my head. So the only way they're going to know what's going on in my head is for me to do what? The only way for them to know what's going on in my head is for me to do what? Tell them. Exactly, Fred. So 
when they give an objection or when they state something, I need to do all the talking to let them know that whatever they said, I agree with them. I can see where they're coming from. I'm in their shoes. Okay? However, if I want them to know what's going on in my head, for example, if I, if I, if I want them to know that a power, they need a power of attorney and not having a power of attorney can prevent them from getting money when they need it most, I know what's going on in my head, which means do, they, do I know what's going on in their head, however? So at the disclosure meeting, when I'm going through point after point after point, I know what's going on in my head. I know the points I want to make, but do they know the points I want to make? No. So who has to do all the talking at a disclosure meeting? See, because I can never make a point. The, I can never make a point. The only people who can make points is who? The only people who can make a point about something is who? Them. They have to make the points. So that we circle back to the whole, hey, how do I use a dirty you for? Well, then who's going to have to make the point that that's a bad thing? Who's going to have to make a point that here's this bad piece of paper? We are going to have to do that. We can't, and it's very difficult to do that. So we have to work through things that we can have them discover for themselves that there's problems. So they have to make the point. So through the disclosure meeting, they have to make the points. How about when we're getting into the implementation stage, when we're making a sales recommendation? Who has to do all the talking when we're making a sales recommendation? Do I know what's going on in my head, in, in my head during a sales, or, uh, a sales presentation? Yeah, I'd sure to heck hope I, do, I know what's going on through my head. But do I know what's going through a client's head? No. So who has to do all the talking during a client presentation? The client does. So we do a lot of talking during the first meeting, but during the second meeting, in the third meeting, during the disclosure meeting, and during the implementation meeting, who should be doing the vast majority of talking? Who should be doing the vast majority of talking? All right, guys, who? Fred's been asking all the questions. How about somebody else answer that question? The client should. Yes, they should. But when I listen to tapes, and when Jeff listens to the tapes of the disclosure meeting and the sale and the uh, presentation meetings, guess who we hear doing all the talking? The advisor. And I'm going to show you the danger of that. The danger of that is it does work. It does work when you do all the talking. It does work when you do all the talking, but there's going to be a problem with it, and I'm going to show you here in a second. Okay? So, do you get when who should be doing uh, who should be doing the talking? If I know if they know what's going on in their head with an objection or a statement, they don't know what's going through my head, so I do all the talking. But if I want to make a point, I can't make that point. They have to do it, and the only way they can do it is if they do all the talking. And the only way I know that they get the point is if they explain it to me, so I know what's going on in their head. So any questions on that? So that skill is called getting them to tell us. So getting on their side, we use getting on their side everywhere. Because anytime they say something we don't like, anytime um, they say something that we do like, we should always be getting on their side, letting them know, giving them little, little pats on the back, mental pats on the back that what they're saying is right. If we get an objection, we do it for five minutes. If we're, if we're just uh, uh, getting them to t tell us during questions, we give little tiny one and uh, two two uh, phrase getting on their side. And what I mean by that is uh, right here we're talking about where we get on where we're getting them to tell us. When we're getting them to tell us, we're doing what? What are we uh, doing a lot of? When we're getting them to tell us, what are we doing a lot of? We're forced to do this. What are we forced to do a lot of? Listening, yeah. Listen, but how do we get them talking? How do we get them talking when when they're telling us? But what? Guys, how, how do I get Jeff to say something? Open-ended questions, Steve. Exactly. Open-ended questions. So the, the, what we find, though, is if we ask uh, question after question after question, we sound like we're drilling them. So, Jeff, you're the client. Okay. So, Jeff, uh, what, what can happen to the market? Uh, it could go up or down. Well, which do which you think is more likely? Well, I'm hoping it would be more likely to go up. And why do you think it's more likely to go up? Well, because that's what it's done over the years. So because it's done that for years, it's going to continue to do that? Well, I'm hopeful. Guys, what does that sound like when I'm asking Jeff questions like that? I'm drilling him, exactly. How long is that going to last, Dale, before he gets mad at me? Not long. 
So now I'm going to do this. I'm trying to pin them down exactly. So now let's. Now here's a little example, though, of uh, uh, getting uh, getting on their side as I'm getting them to tell me. So I'm going to do the same thing. So so all I'm going to do is tag on at the end of every question, and Jeff gives me an answer. Tag on a little mental pat on the back. So I'll do the same thing. Jeff, which direction is the market going to go? I guess it could go up or down. Yeah, I mean, we don't know that. We don't have a crystal ball, do we? So it could go up no. or down. And w which way do you think it'll it'll go? I think it'll go up. Yeah, I mean, why wouldn't it? I mean, th things are starting to turn around, and and uh, over time, you know, things do do. The uh, market generally does go up. So absolutely. So, and w why do you think it's going to go up? Uh, well, you know, uh, unemployment seems to be coming down a little bit. Uh, inflation is still low. I just think companies are doing better and hiring more. I just think it'll go up. Yeah, I, yeah. I mean, for all those reasons you said, things are starting to trend upward. So that, absolutely, the, the market should go up. So now, same exact conversation. How did it sound the second time? See, it sounds more like a conversation the second time. So when you can ask, have the same exact conversation, and all I did is any time Jeff answered my questions, because I have to ask those questions, because I can't tell Jeff, well, Jeff, you know what? The market's going to go up. I can't do that. Or, Jeff, the market's going to go down. That, that does not work. They have to tell me these things. But if I just ask, 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 pretty soon it feels like I'm just drilling them. So all I do is when I ask those questions, and Jeff gives me an answer, I, now, did I go on for five minutes when I was getting on the side? No. I only do the five minute getting on the side when he gives me an objection. Was Jeff giving me any objections there, or was he just answering my questions? He was just answering my questions. So all I do is give a little five or six things that, that um, uh, make him feel comfortable. I'm giving them those mental pats on the back. So does that make sense? Does that show you how you can take and ask somebody, guys, I've been, they've actually, t not timed, but get click counters on how many questions I ask during a meeting. I ask thousands of questions during a meeting. I mean, over just one topic, I'll ask 150 questions on just one topic. How can I do that without getting them pissed at me? By doing what I just showed you. Anytime they answer, I give them a mental pat on the, pat on the back. And how many times are people uh, open to being patted on the back? Forever and ever and ever. Does that make sense? So uh, we even when we're um, getting them to tell us, which is a skill I want to talk about today, we're still using a little bit of getting on their side, not just not just huge five-minute ones, but just little tiny short uh, short phrase ones. Does that make sense to everybody? You want to jump in there with any clarifications there, Jeff? Well, it's very important. I, I think the hardest part for guys to understand is, you know, when they should talk. So if you're agreeing with them, you, you should be doing the talking. When you think that they're, they might not agree with you, they need to do the talking. Yeah, that's a pretty and good explanation. asking questions is the only way to get them talking. Yep. So, like I said, today we want to talk about the skill of getting them to tell us. We're going to use that at the disclosure meeting and implementation meeting. We don't, we don't necessarily need to do that at all during the agreement meeting. So, how do we get them to tell us? First of all, does anybody have a question uh, um, on what I'm talking about by getting them to tell us? Does anybody have any questions on that? So this is the only way you can sell today, and I'm going to explain why. Because the other ways still work, but it's the only permanent way to sell. Here's why. I've talked to you guys. You guys are excellent salespeople. You are excellent at selling things. You wouldn't have had the success you've already had if you were not able to sell things. So I'm not going to sit here and tell you that you couldn't sell something. I'm not going to sit here and tell you that you couldn't sell them on the fact that their guy is bad. I'm not going to sit here and tell you that you couldn't sell them on buying an annuity. I'm not going to sit here and tell you that you couldn't sell them on, on uh, selling a sale or on selling whatever you wanted to do. I'm, I'm extremely – I've talked to you guys. You guys are excellent sell, salespeople. I, I am not going to argue that because I would be wrong. You guys are excellent sales salespeople. So what's the problem then? If you sell, if you're an excellent salesperson and you sell somebody something, what's the problem then? I want you to think about this. Because you guys are all excellent salespeople. You wouldn't be in the position you're at. You wouldn't have made the money you're at 
of Dale. You're getting close. You're exactly remorse. And what, do you, what causes remorse, Dale? They can be unsold, Frederick. Exactly. If you can sell them, guess what? Somebody else can sell them as well. If all you do is sell them, somebody else can go back and resell them. And I tell you, the, the person who tells them the biggest lie last gets what? The person they talk to last who sells them and gives them the biggest lie, and do our competitors lie? Do they uh, accuse uh, uh, or, or uh, say there's going to be huge tax problems when there's not tax problems or offer rates of return that really aren't valid, like we, like we just talked about with REITs? Do they do that kind of stuff? Yes, they do. So if all you do is sell them, if all you do is sell them, they can be unsold. And I will tell you, in today's world, if they leave your office sold, what's going to happen to them before the deal's in the can? Give me some examples of what will happen when they leave your office and what will happen before the deal is totally in the can. What's going to happen? Before the, the deal is completely sealed, what's going to happen? Give me some ideas. They'll think about it, sure. When they think about it, where do they go? Well, they may go back to their guy. That's one thing. Yeah, but where do they go, guys? They're thinking about it. What do they do? Do they just sit there and ponder and go into meditation? Yeah, right, Pam. They'll go to friends. Who else would they go to? What places they'll go to friends? Who else would they go to? Internet, children, accountant, attorneys, you're right. All you guys are right, exactly. So go to somebody else. And, of course, what will every single one of those people say? The Internet, the, their attorneys, their friends, their children. What will all of those people say? That the, the move they made was a great move? What will all those people tell them? That's right, Eric. They'll start, <laughs> Eric Hagen, you're right. They'll start looking for reasons not to move forward, and they're going to get it from their kids, their accountant, their attorney, the Internet, their friends, everybody's going to tell them why not to move forward. That's why if you just sell them, you're never going to make a ton of money because what you sold them will be unsold. However, what did we just talk about beliefs? What did we just talk about beliefs? How easy is it to change people's beliefs? How easy is it to change people's beliefs, guys? I want you to get this, so I want you to type it in. How easy is it to change people's beliefs? Very, very hard. Just when it comes to their relationship with us? So is it only us that find it hard to change people's beliefs? Because we're salespeople and they're not. Or we're consultants and not. So we're the only people that find it hard to change people's beliefs. Is that right? How many of you have tried to change your dad's point of view? Your dad's belief or your mom's belief? Any of you tried to do that? Yeah, ha, 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 exactly, Eric. How many of you tried to change your spouse's belief on something? Your teenage son's belief on something? Does it really matter the relationship between the two people when it comes to changing their beliefs on something? How hard is it to, for a pastor to change the belief of somebody in their congregation who maybe has had a big tragedy and, and no longer believes in God? How hard is it for people to change people's beliefs? And it doesn't matter. So I'm not talking between us and the client. I'm talking about human being to human being. <clears throat> Once somebody's had has a belief, it's, in, it's really difficult to have them change the belief. And the more you try to tell them their belief is wrong, the more they do what? The more you try to tell them that their belief is wrong, the more they do what? Defend it. Dig in their heels. Push you away. Exactly. So here's why getting them to tell us is so important. When we get them to tell us, not once, but over and over and over, that what they're discovering about their guy, or what, uh, how our recommendation helps them, how our recommendation doesn't have the... Uh, or, or they can live with all of our recommendations downsides or all of our their, uh, the um, negatives of our investment. They tell us they believe that they can live with those things. If they leave our office believing those things, and can we tell them, by us telling them, does that make them believe it? No. There's only one way they believe it is if they say it. And if they say it just once, no. Over and over and over. When they say it over and over and over and over, they leave believing it. So when they leave believing that their guy is screwing them at the disclosure meeting, if they leave believing that our solution is the best solution and that the, uh, the disadvantages that our solution has are things that are, are less disadvantageous than what they currently have, 
that the, the problems of our, our, rep, our, our um, solution are much less th than they currently have, that, that are, maybe they're worried about, or we have walked them through um, um, liquidity. They find out, yeah, uh, what we're offering is not liquid. It absolutely is not liquid, but it's a heck of a lot more liquid than what they currently have. Now, if they've told us that and explained that 15 different ways before they leave our office, they're going to believe it. If I tell them our guys, if I tell them our our solution is more liquid than what they currently have, what's that worth? Can I get them to believe me? If I tell them and explain to them that what we have is is currently pretty liquid, has 10% liquidity, and they'll never need that. If I tell them that, can I get them to believe that? Yes, I can get them to believe it. But somebody else can, can as Jay points out, will get them to not believe it. Exactly. But when I have them explain to me over and over and over that it's more liquid than what they have currently, that they'll never need that much money, that, that they'll never need the 10% liquidity, they'll never need it for cars, they'll never need it for a roof, they'll never need it for giving it to the kids, they'll never need it for, for um, going on vacation. Uh, the, the only time they'd ever need it is for long-term care. And if they needed it for long-term care, this is a lot more liquid than a mutual fund or stock bond, etc. I mean, when they tell me that over and over and over, they leave believing it. If I tell them that over and over and over and over, I can sell them on the idea, but that can be unsold. But if they tell me it over and over and over and over, they believe it. So when they go home and their friend or their son tries to tell them that, this is, that what they're investing is not liquid, what will they do? If they tell me over and over and over that this thing is more liquid than anything else out there, more liquid than they'll ever need, more liquid in a long-term care situation, more liquid than any other choice they have, not by little but by far, and then their son or their attorney or their accountant tries to tell them that it's not liquid, what will that client do? Tell their friend they're wrong, Eric. They'll argue with them, John. Yes, they won't believe them, Dale. Exactly. That's why it's so important to get them to tell us. And, and Jeff, do I get them to tell me one time? Oh, no. Many, 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 many times. And why does it take many, many, many times, Jeff? Why, wouldn't, why don't I just believe them the first time they tell me? Why, why don't I believe them? They told me it. Why do I need more than that? Because it's the first time that they're coming to that conclusion. So it has to be reinforced over and over and over so there's no going back. Because, Jeff, you go to church, right? Mm -hmm. And you go to church once every five years, right? Because all you do is say, yeah, I believe in God. I'm going to follow his ways once, once every five years, right? No, I go every week. Why do you go every week? Uh, to be reminded. Yeah, guys, belief takes what? Repetition. Belief takes over and over and over to, to, to make that belief concrete. So that's the, the importance of being able to ask a lot of questions and then the skill of when you're asking a lot of questions to get on their side a little bit to soften it so it doesn't sound like you're drilling them. Instead, it sounds like you're having a conversation. Okay? Any questions on why it, you can't sell things to people? Oh, did everybody lose their sound? Did everybody lose their sound? Let me see if I can write this. Okay, good. I don't know what happened, Steve. Everybody else is good, so I'm not sure. You'll have to check, uh, check here what's happened for yourself. Um, so th that's why we can, it's not that selling doesn't work. It can work. It doesn't work with everybody, but it can work. The nice thing is, though, is getting them to tell you works with everybody. Selling works with some people. Getting them to tell you works with everybody. Selling can be unsold. Getting them to tell you can never be unsold. Guys, I had 232 new clients. When I finally figured this stuff out, the first two years I brought on 232 new clients, I had two people that signed paperwork change their mind. I'll put that record up against anybody in the industry. 232, two, only two signed paperwork and then called them and said, I have to stop it. One because of an illness and the other because they were moving out of the area. So I don't even count those two as people changing their mind. So that's the importance of getting them to tell you because they believe it. And when they believe it, is this one person's belief is equal to the force of 99 who have only only have interest in it. Belief is extremely, extremely strong. And when you get them leaving your office believing things, it cannot be unturned. And when I say believing, I'm not talking about yes or no's. I'm not saying, so, so Jeff, uh, does this make sense to you? Yeah, it makes sense. 
Super. Should we go ahead and get started today? Uh, be <laughs> Let's assume I sold you. Yeah. We I, didn't get get you to tell, I didn't get you to tell me, but I sold you. I said, so, so, so should we get started today? Yeah, we can get started. Yeah, so we, so we get started. And I assume, hey, Jeff told me that he, what I said meant sense. Jeff told me he wanted to get started, so I assume that Jeff is all set to go, right? Is a yes or a no worth anything, guys? Yes and no is worthless. Do I know what's going on in Jeff's head when he says yes? Do I have any clue what's going on in Jeff's head when he says yes? He could be say, yes, uh, let's get this. The, the easiest way for me to get out of here is just sign this so I can, get, so I can uh, cancel it later on. Yes, uh, I know my wife wants to do this, but I'm going to talk her out of it in the car. Yes, I mean, it's, yes means nothing to us. We need to have them say more. So uh, uh, Dale asks, if you screw up and sold someone, can you recover? Absolutely. So if you sold somebody, how would you recover from that, guys? So that's, that's a great question. If, uh, hey, guys, I made mistakes all the time when I was meeting with people. But the more I did it, the more I could recognize the mistake as I had just done it or in the middle of doing it, so I could immediately do what? Turn around and do things right. So if they just give me a yes because I sold them, what can I do to recover? I just circle right around and say, yeah, well, why, Jeff? Why should we go ahead? And if Jeff can't give me the answer, I have to what? Circle back and have Jeff tell me. So you'll see here. The last question we always ask people to determine whether we sold them or whether we did it the right way is the question, why? If Jeff cannot answer me, then I have my answer. Did I do a good job? If I say, so Jeff, why should we move forward? Hmm. No, I'm not sure. I mean, I guess it just kind of makes sense for now. So what has Jeff told me? Did I do a good job or a bad job up to that point? See, that's the great thing about the system, guys. Is you can always test yourself to see whether if things are going well or not. If I ask why and he can't tell me why, that means I can move forward or I can't move forward to my next point. If I ask why and he cannot answer that question, can I move forward? No, I can't until he tells me what he believes. And I need him to believe that point before I can move on. So all you do, Dale... And anybody else, it's, uh, we all do it. We all screw up and say, gosh darn, I just sold that person instead of letting him tell me. All you do then is then circle back. And actually, it, it actually works very well. And, I, and remember, Dale, to remind me when we get to this point, you ask, what if I sell somebody? Can I recover it? Actually, we call that tell, um, um, uh, uh, retail, tell and retell. So I'll explain that here at the very end. It's actually, you can actually use it as one of the techniques to get them to tell you. So the way that we do this is similar to the way you were in school. <laughs> the way we get them to tell us things is very similar to the way our, our, our teachers gave us a test in school. And if you think about it, it's very similar, right? If we're changing their beliefs, we need to constantly test them to see if their beliefs are changed or not. So we're constantly testing, testing, testing to see if their beliefs have changed or not. So if you remember in school, what was the easiest test to take? The easiest test to take was the true-false, right? So you can always start out with true-false. Those are yes-no's, are true-falses. So on the hierarchy, are the yes-no's horrible? No. It's just that they're the weakest of all of the questions we can ask them. The second thing we're going to do is do matching. Remember, you can do matching, then fill in the blank, then multiple choice. But the granddaddy of all, in order for the, the teacher to know whether we got a subject or not, they always ask us, and did they essay, right, Dale, essay question. They always ask the essay. Now, did they put the essay at the beginning or did they put the essay at the end? They always put the essay at the end. Why do you think they put the essay at the end, guys? Why do you think they had true falses and matchings and fill in the blank and multiple choice and then put the essay at the end? Why do you think they did that? There's a purpose for why they did this. And it's a purpose why we always do the essay at the end as well. Why? Because if you put the essay right up front, that's hard, because how many people's brains are set up to immediately whip out an essay answer like that? Not many people can do that. So they get, give all these other questions up front. The true, false, matching, fill in the blank, multiple choice. What they're doing is priming the pump. They're kind of already giving the, the, the answer to the essay through all the questions they ask, all the matchings, fill in the blank, and multiple choice. They're already kind of warming it up and giving them the answers to the essay. So when they finally get to the essay, you already have all the meat 
All you need to do is put it together in order. Does that make sense? And that's what we do as well. Is we always go to the, the essay question to see, did, did I sell them or did they tell me? Okay? Now, again, I'm going to go back to, uh, if they can't tell you why, all you're going to do is circle around. So this is an answer to, to the question earlier, which is what happens if you sell them? What do you, how can you fix that? Well, if you ask why and they're not clear, you just circle around again. And the example I give is long division. And any of you that have children, how many, um, <laughs> we take long division, I mean, we could just whip out long division in a second, right? But how long does it take for a child to learn long division? How many weeks do they spend on it in school? Do they spend three days and then move on to the next subject? See, what you have to understand is the things that we do every day seem simple and easy to us. Just like common long division seems simple and easy to us. But if you remember how your children did long division, it took a whole year to teach them long division. They start, they, they'd spend a couple weeks on it. Then they would leave it and go back to another subject. Then they'd come back, and then they'd leave it, and they'd come back, and they'd leave it, and they'd come back, and they'd leave it. And guess what? Every time they came back, what did they find out? The kids, how, many of the kids, how much did the kids remember? The whole thing? No, because it's difficult. I mean, if you go back to remember uh, taking calculus, what made sense on the board when you were with the teacher, as soon as you left that, that classroom, what happened to all the sense that it made on the board? It goes right out the window. And believe it or not, the things that we're teaching these people is calculus. It's long division. They, they, it, it's things they've never seen before. So we have to go over it over and over and over. That's why we ask question after question after question. But I tell you, as salespeople, do we like to go over and over and over things? Or do we like to get from point A to point B as quick as possible, guys? See, we've got a problem, both as men as, and as salespeople. As men and salespeople, how long do we want to take to get from point A to point B? As men, how long do we want to take? Shortest path possible. As salespeople, what path do we want to take? Shortest path possible. So when I'm getting somebody to explain something, I... It will take 15 minutes. But I'll tell you, I'll, let me give you an idea of how, I see, how um, uh, I see you guys doing it. So here's how you would explain the Holy Bible or have a client say to, uh, to tell you the Holy Bible. Say, so Jeff, here, here's the thing. There's a story about a carpenter. And then this carpenter, what he did is uh, he found out his father was, you know, a pretty high muckety-muck. And then... Um, he started to to uh, to you know really do his father's work, and he got twelve dudes together with him, and they started walking around the countryside, and they started telling everybody the word, and then you know what the government they got pissed at him, and then they killed him. Okay. So there's the Holy Bible, right? There's the whole uh, New Testament, right, guys? What more do you need? What did Jeff learn from that uh, tale of the of the New Testament? Nothing. So I'll give you another example. Somebody give me a movie. Somebody give me a popular movie. Name of somebody throw out a popular movie. Gone with the Wind. Perfect. So Gone with I like Braveheart better. So Braveheart. Well, you know, Jeff, there was this guy. He was in Scotland, and it was during the feudal times, and he got just the the, the king's men killed his his girlfriend. He got mad, him and his buds got together and they started killing people, but you know in the end, who always wins? The little guy or the big guy? The big guy. Yeah, the big guy. So they ended up catching this guy and killing him, so all that was for, for naught. There's the whole story, guys. Do you need to see it? <laughs> that you can't, if I need them to tell me why the power of attorney is so essential that it can, if they don't have it, they won't be able to get money when they need it most. Can I just tell Jeff? So, Jeff, here's the thing about the power of attorney. Power of attorney is important, isn't it? Yeah. Mike, yeah, cause I you, think cause, so. Yeah, because what's it help you do? Uh, well, make decisions if anything happens to me. Yeah, and most importantly, decisions about what? Money. Money. So, and the thing about money is do you need it when you need it most or do you need it when you don't need it at all? When you need it when you need it. Yeah, so the power of attorney really is important because it gets you money when you need it what? When you need it. Yeah. So do I need to go any further, guys? So I covered that in about 20 seconds. What did Jeff learn from that? Nothing. Nothing. I need Jeff to, 
to walk through that movie step by step. If I'm talking about Braveheart, I want them to understand how horrible it was for this uh, the the relationship that that um what's his face had with with the <laughs> that Mel Gibson had with his girlfriend before the 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 soldiers um killed her and what how they and how they uh took advantage of her and how they killed her at the stake and and how I mean, that that's what draws people into the story that's what people uh, makes people remember the story changes their beliefs you have to get bring them in. They need to see a little movie in their head. So when I went through that with Jeff about Power's Attorney, when I went through that with Jeff about Braveheart or about the Bible, was there any story going on in Jeff's head? I'm sorry, any movie going on in Jeff's head? Or was it just a bunch of words or facts? Facts don't make sales. You guys know that. Emotions make sales. And the way you get people emotional, I'm sorry, the, uh, is through stories. The way that you change beliefs is through emotion. They have to have a little movie running through their head. Does that make sense to everybody? Does anybody not get that? Okay. So how do we do that? Well, as I said earlier, the one we use kind of the, the same techniques that teachers use on us that will do true and false questions and matching questions and fill in the blank questions and multiple choice questions. And then we always end with an essay to make sure they get it. So the techniques that we use to do those different types of questions is one of the things you let me or you'll see me uh, do quite often, especially when I'm teaching live, is not finishing my sentences. I make I, I get to a point where, uh, so Jeff, I mean, it's uh, we live in Minnesota because because we it's so hot here and we like to get sunburned all the time. Or or what do we know? It's going to well, happen every winter. Well, it's going to snow. Yeah, when it snows, it gets it gets bad. It so gets I cold. Used to, yeah, so a couple of things there. I, I let Jeff finish my sentences, and the other thing is I end the sentences with what a lot. You guys probably have noticed that I have this tick, and the tick is. Making or, or ending sentences with what? Do you think that's a tick or do you think that's on purpose? See, it's my barometer to see, are you following? Oh, Jay, thanks a lot, Jay, a tick. <laughs> <laughs> I do it on purpose. <laughs> I do it on purpose to make, so I know if Jeff's getting what I'm saying. I, I want to know if Jeff understands what I'm saying. So another thing is I do is a ridiculous or exaggeration, or I talk in a language where they can predict what you're going to say. You'll notice a lot of times, if you listen carefully, I'll talk and sing song, or I'll repeat things three times. There's a reason for that, because people are used to patterns in speech, and the more familiar the pattern is, the more the, they'll uh, uh, follow it along in their head, and we'll explain that here in a second. And then, as, as we were talking about earlier, here's the tell-retell, which is, what if, we had the question from Dale, if, what if I sell them, can I fix it? Yeah, that's an example of tell retell, and we'll talk about that in a second. So, first thing we'll talk about is the, how I use exaggeration. One of the examples I give is the lawnmower story. So, if I'm, if you're all familiar with the lawnmower story at the first meeting, what we do is we want them to invite us in. We want them to ask for our advice instead of us just shoving the advice on them. So, I'm talking about the lawnmower story, and I'll say, uh, let me do it this way once. I'll say, uh, so Jeff, you're the client. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it uh, one way, and then I'm going to do it another way. So I'll do it the first way. So, Jeff, I've just finished my lawn. I've, I've been really sweating at it. I've got cross hatches on it. I'm really proud of my lawn. And so and I'm finishing. I'm, I'm looking at my lawn. I'm kind of gloating about it. And, you know, my neighbor walks across the street, and, and you know, and he, he leans over the and says, Hey, Mike, I've got a couple things you might want to consider. Uh, number one is maybe you shouldn't... Uh, um, Feed your lawn during the day. You might want to do that in the the uh, new, uh, or in the afternoon when it's less uh, heat, and that won't burn your lawn. And then, and maybe just sharpen your lawnmower blades. What do I think about that, Jeff? No, that's that's helpful. I mean, probably <laughs> good advice. So, so then I'm thinking, oh wow, that didn't work the way it's supposed to. Because Jeff's supposed to tell me he didn't that that guy's a lousy louse, right? Now, he, here's how we use exaggeration. Say, so Jeff, I've just finished my lawn. I've got cross hatches in it. I spent hours on it, and I'm proud of it. I mean, I'm looking at it. I think I've done, done a pretty good job. But then I look across the street, and now oh, here he comes. The neighborhoods know it all, sauntering across with his, his Panama hat cocked, his drink in his hand, and I know I'm going to get all sorts of free advice. And this guy leans across the fence. He goes, Mike, I don't know. Now what do I Is there a difference there, guys? What does Jeff know before I even say what happens? This guy's a likable guy or not a likable guy? Not likable. I set it up with exaggeration. I, I make this guy sound what? 
Is there any doubt that whatever comes out of this guy's mouth is going to be something bad? That's exaggeration. Okay, does anybody get questions on that? That's, that's one type of way that, and you'll hear me do that all the time. Because I never want to ask a question I don't know the answer to. So the way I make sure that I never ask a, uh, ask a question that I don't know the answer to is make the, the, question, or the answer obvious. So is it going to be obvious to Jeff that this guy is a jerk, that anything he says is something I'm not going to like? Yes. So we use that a lot. The other one is, is um, to uh, um, make sure that they, that, to, well, we actually do, I'm going to get this to a little bit later. It's actually tell retail, so I'm going to skip this slide with the last slide. So this is actually tell retail. And then uh, talk and pop music, we've talked about that which is talking in sing-song or in, in cliches or things that are very familiar to people. Guys, do you know what the number one um, uh, characteristic of a pop song is? There's actually a formula for writing a very popular pop song. What's the number one form, uh, thing? A hook. And what, Jay, you're exactly right, a hook. And what's important about the hook? Something that can be what? You're exactly right, Jay, a hook. What, that means what? Easily remembered, exactly. Easily remembered and easily repeated. People don't like surprises. They don't like music. They, the, jazz is very much a, an acquired taste because people normally don't like jazz, especially experimental jazz, because they don't know what's coming next. If you want a song to be popular with the masses, it's something that has to have a hook, something that's easily remembered, something where you know what the next note's going to be or the next word's going to be. So as much as possible, that's why I use cliches or I use stories, I use the obvious, because people like the obvious. How many of you have ever been to a store? Yeah, they like the familiar, exactly right. So you, you don't want to go, people don't like movies where the end isn't what they expect. People hate movies where the end isn't what they expect. People don't like songs where the song isn't, where the next note isn't what they expect. So give people what they expect. That's why you see that I use a lot of cliches, a lot of uh, uh, stories where it's obvious what the answer is. You don't try to surprise people. And then the tell retell, and this is where I want to make my point. Anybody can do this skill. Some of the other things we talked about are acquired, and you'll learn them over time. The multiple choice and the, and the uh, uh, exaggeration, things like that. You'll learn those over time. But I would tell you that every single one of you can do this right now, because you've all done it in your, pa in your lives. Have any of you ever read a book to a child? Have any of you ever, anybody not read a book to a child? Let me ask you that. Anybody not read a book to a child? See, because when you read a book to a child, you read the book, right? You read the book, but then the child, if it's a good book, do they want to continue to talk about it? If it's a, it's a good book and they're excited about it, they want to continue to talk about it. So here's what you do. You read them the book, and then you say, so Jeff, Jeff, what, 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 happened, what happened when that billy goat talked to that, that monster under the bridge? The monster told him that if he tried to cross the bridge, he was going to eat him. Yeah, and that Billy Goat, did he, did he have a trick up his sleeve for that monster? Yeah, he did. Yeah, what did he do? I don't remember the story. I don't remember the story either. <laughs> but guys, have you done that before with children? So what you're doing, the bus story I was going to show you earlier was what, how we walk through the power of attorney story with the uh, client. Or we also have the uh, beneficiary story with the, the gal who gets... Um, uh, um, unfortunately marries a bad dude and then ends up passing away and her 401k goes to the bad dude instead of her family. What we do there is we tell the story. But then what can we do? After we've told the story, what can we do? We circle back and then have the client what? So we can go ahead and tell the story, but then we have to, can we stop it? No, we have to circle back and have the client do what? Tell it back to us, right, Jay? Then they, we just have the client tell it back to us. So th Anybody can get a client to tell them things. The simple, right now, today, you can do this right now just by telling them and then having them retell the story back to you. It's the simplest way to do it. And then as, after you do that, you'll start to, other, these other things will actually start to come naturally to you. The exaggeration and the, the um, uh, ending sentences with what or letting them end your sentences or talking sing-song or in more... Uh, um, uh, familiar type phrases that they'll finish for you. Those things will start to come naturally, but you have to start doing the tell-retell at the very least today.
because that's the only way you're going to learn this stuff is to practice, 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 always be doing that. Now, he, the one thing, last thing I want to cover is I have, anytime I explain this to people, over and over and over, an advisor will tell me, well, the people weren't very bright, Mike. They just don't get this stuff. They were just looking at me with glass eyes. And, I, you know, so obviously I couldn't get them to tell me. I just had to do it for them. What do you think I, excuse me, what do you think I tell those people, that all those advisors that tell me that? Too complicated? Yeah, uh, yeah. in a sense, Jay, I am going to say that, which is that um, if, if they're not getting it, should I skate through and assume that they're not getting it because they're not smart? Is that what I should assume, or what should I assume? No, Jay, what should I assume? That I'm not very good at doing this. So that means I better what? Slow it down. That's right, Dale, I blew it. So I need to slow it down, ask smaller questions, go in baby steps. But can I move forward? Yeah, I can move forward, and I can sell them. And then when they go home, they're going to be what? Resold. And who's going to come out? To, <laughs> who's, who's the advantage that's going to come out to? Mine or the other guy who resells them? There is no, if you cannot, these concepts can easily, to, the, to anybody of even below average intelligence, can be explained in a manner that they get it. You just have to have the patience to do that. What I find is when advisors tell me that, oh, these people just weren't bright enough, you know, they're not experienced enough, oh, they're smart people, but they're just not familiar with these kind of topics. No. What the guy is saying is, I'm lazy. I don't want to spend the time doing it. Why would I want to spend 15 minutes doing it when I can just tell them how it is in one minute? Why would I possibly want to spend 15 minutes exercising the time, having them learn this stuff for themselves when I can just tell them in one minute? And unfortunately, it works often enough to keep you what? Just selling them works often enough to keep you what? Doing it. Instead of doing what you should do. So you need to make sure that you invest the time to let them figure things out for themselves. It, it, it works on everybody. So I got a question here from Eric. It says, are props, pictures, visuals, etc., during our stories a good or a bad idea? An excellent idea. I, I paint a lot of pictures with my hands. I, I, I tell people the answer to the next part of the story with my hands. Uh, I, I'll draw pictures on, on a yellow pad. Absolutely. Those things are all excellent to get people to understand. Absolutely. You know what's not excellent? Hypotheticals. You know what's not excellent? Uh, illustrations. You'll never, I've never, Jeff, have I, do I sell with hypotheticals or illustrations ever, ever, ever? No. Why no. wouldn't I? Because it's proof right there. It's proof right there that my recommendation makes the most sense, Jeff. Yeah, but that's the problem. It's, it's proof. They're not coming to their own conclusion. You're relying on a piece of paper to, to tell them, and they're just supposed to believe it. And you know what's crazy? And tell me if you've heard this, Jeff. The same people that will tell you that this guy didn't get it, that's why I didn't have them walk through it. So instead, I use an illustration. What's wrong with that mentality? Well, if they don't get what you're saying, then they're <laughs> not going to get the illustration. That's right. But, you know, when they showed them the illustration, they said, so do you see this? What did the client say? Uh-huh. Yeah, sure. What was the client really saying? Yeah, I, Whatever. Knows? I don't know. <laughs> Do you get this, guys? So any questions on this? Well, uh, Dale, I'm, I'm confused. You say they're not interested. Kick them out. What do you mean by they're not interested? So I got a question here. They're not interested. Kick them out. So help me understand what you're... I'll make an assumption he's saying, cause, uh, oh, not playing along. Well, if they're not playing along, what does that say about uh, my story? Because you're right, Dale, you may kick them out. But the first thing I have to evaluate myself is either they're not getting the point of the story, or my story is not very interesting, or I'm taking too short a steps or too long a steps. But... If they're not, uh, if they're just pushing, 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 saying enough with this, just give me the straight, the straight poop. Yeah, they may. Now that guess how often that should happen. First of all, because I want to make a clarification. If that, how often should that happen? So I'll tell you how often it happened to me. It happened probably one out of every twenty or thirty times. So you're right, Dale. If out of one out of thirty times, 
somebody does that, it's obvious. They're there for one reason and one reason only, which is to get the facts. And the reason they're there to get the facts is not to work with me, but to steal them and either do it themselves or go back to their guy. I will kick them out. However, if this happens more than one in 30 times, what does it tell me? I haven't told a good story, Al, exactly. I haven't told a good story. So th it's going to happen, but it happens extremely rarely. If it's happening way too often, then we have to evaluate our stories. So what's the best yeah. way to evaluate our story? Uh, go ahead, Jeff. Well, yeah, and, and I've, I've heard people say that a lot, and, and here's what I find. Um, the first thing you have to look at is yourself. So if there's a problem, I'm not going to necessarily assume right away that it's the client. I'm going to wonder if it's me. Am I doing something? Am I not telling a good story? Or more often than not, what I find when people get that way is because the conversations are grilling. They're not conversations. You're, you're grilling them. You're asking them question after question after question. And they can tell that you're driving towards some point. So they just figure, you know what, just tell me. I mean, you're obviously trying to make a point. What's your point? So is that the client or is that you? Um, nine times out of ten, it's you. Not that it can't ever be the client, but nine times out of ten, it's you just saying, um, do the markets ever go down? Yeah, they go down. What happens when they go down? Well, then that's not good. What's not good about it? What's your point? Or if you do, again, just to kind of hammer this point home, so Jeff, what, what, uh, what direction can the markets go? Well, they can go up or down. Yeah, up or down. We, do, we, do we really know what's going to happen? No, not for sure. No, I mean, I mean, none of us. We don't have a crystal ball in my pocket, or you know, some. You know, I don't have a direct line to to God that tells me those kind of things. So, what do we do when we don't know if it's going to go up or down? Well, we want to be prepared for whatever might come our way. I mean, isn't that really? I mean, I'll go back to the Boy Scout days. I'll always be what? I'll always be prepared. Yeah, because if you're not prepared, you know, and here's the f sad thing: when you're prepared, what happens? Uh, nothing. Nothing. When you're not prepared, what always happens, though? Uh, the worst. Yeah. So what's the difference there between what Jeff did first, which is question, answer, question, answer, question, answer? Do you think people are going to say, what's your point, Mike, when I'm doing it that way? How often will it happen when I do it that way? So Jeff's right on target. He's right on target. When you do that, it's because they see your, I mean, you're just asking, asking question after question after question, which makes them feel like you're backing them into a corner. When you back them into the corner, they're going to say, before you get them into the corner, they say, hey, 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 what's your point? So does that make sense to everybody? How would you define the correct way? Well, I, again, asking questions was following up with one or two phrase pats on the back, mental pats on the back. That's the correct way. Ask a question, they give you an answer. So just go through it one more time. So Jeff, um, is liquidity good or bad? Oh, liquidity is good. Why? Because we might need our money. And why would we need our money? Well, we would just stuff. Groceries, house bills, just emergencies. I don't know, just stuff. And if you didn't have money to get your stuff, how would you feel? Well, when, how does that feel, when, guys? Jeff, how does that feel when I'm doing that to you? feels like you're, you're trying to make a point. And how long before like, you say, what's your point? It wouldn't be much longer. I wouldn't let it go much longer than that. And we were at it, for guys, for less than 15 seconds. And he's already getting impatient. But I say, so Jeff, what's important about liquidity? Well, you want to be able to get your money if you need it. You, you're not tooting, you do, don't you? Cause you? Did you work a long time for that or not very long for that? Well, we worked a really long time for it. Yeah. And you know what? When we work a long time for something... We don't want to be told when we can get it or when we can't get it, do we? We want it no. when we what? We want it when we want it. Yeah. And, and, and why is that so important? Well, emergencies, you know, you, things come up that you just can't plan for. You just you have to have flexibility. Right, because we never can plan for those things. I mean, nobody sends us an email telling us an emergency is going to happen, do they? They yeah. happen. They're surprises, aren't they? Right. And you know what? If we're not ready for those surprises, what can happen? Well, then... We're going to get surprised inevitably. Yeah. It's going to be bad. Yeah, I mean, it's, we're, we're going to be surprised, and, and it's going to be bad. So what's the difference? How long before Jeff gets mad at me doing that, guys? You're acknowledging, relating, agreeing to answers. Exactly, Jay. That's exactly right. You're acknowledge, I'm acknowledging, relating, and agreeing to his answer. I'm giving him mental pats on the back. So how long could I do that to you, Jeff, before you just get angry at me? Oh, a real long time. I mean... There would be no reason to be angry. 
Because, guys, we love to be told that we're right. And all I'm doing is every time Jeff answers me is I'm giving him a little pat on the back right. Did I go on for five minutes about being right? Or did I just give him a little pat on the back with a right? So that's all we're doing. Does that make sense? So this is something that you need to practice continually. And, you'll, and, and again, don't practice it in the office. Practice it everywhere. It's the best way to communicate with your spouse, your teenage son, the maid or D, the dry cleaner, the policeman who gives you a ticket. So I mean, uh, this, is the, this is, needs to become ingrained. And again, by personality, I am not a person who asks a lot of questions. I've become a person who asks a lot of questions, but by personality, I'm a person that says how it is, what my beliefs are, and if you don't believe with me, you're stupid. That's what my personality is, and anybody that knows me will acknowledge that. But that's not how you get people to change their beliefs. I can bully them into agreeing with me until they walk out of the room, but they will not change their beliefs. The way you get them to change their beliefs is having them tell you. This is an extremely important exercise. The best way to do it is practice it and tape yourself doing it because then you can determine, if Jeff, as Jeff points out, whether you're just grilling them or if you're get, getting them involved and patting, giving them those little mental pats on the back which allows you to do this forever and ever. Does that make sense to everybody? You dance with them, exactly, Jay. So was this a worthwhile call, guys? I, this is kind of our uh, first time broaching this subject. Did you get some stuff out of it that you'll be able to use? Great. Excellent. Super. Because we're going to continue to work on getting on their side, both agreeing with them and getting, learning how to get them to tell us things. Because, guys, if you can get them to tell you things and you can get on their side, guess how much money you can make. <laughs> the sky is the limit. Okay? So have a great rest of the week, and we'll talk to you uh, next Monday. Thanks, guys.